Linda and I are in St. Joseph, Missouri, and there's some things here that make this town very special. And one of them is this building behind me. This is the original Pony Express stables. You've all heard of the Pony Express riders. This is where it started. This is the building that the first rider left from. 1,996 miles in 10 days. A daring horseback relay mail service connects the nation. These three gentlemen, William H. Russell, Alexander Majors, and William B. Waddell, partners in the freighting firm of Russell, Majors, and Waddell, agreed to start a pony relay system from St. Joseph, Missouri to Sacramento, California. The idea was to speed up the delivery of mail from the eastern United States to California. The distance between these cities was 1,996 miles. It says here there was 165 stations approximately 10 miles apart. The rider changed horses at each station, but each rider, ro but each rider rode between 75 and 100 miles per day. A rider changed horses eight to 10 times per ride. It was quite the undertaking, and it's because the East Coast was settled, and all the way to here to uh, St. Joseph, Missouri was pretty settled. But between here and San Francisco, it was just wide open, barren country with nothing. And San Francisco and the California coast was getting to be a very popular place with large cities and nothing in between. It took a long time to get a message from New York to San Francisco. This was about to change all of that. So on April 3rd, 1860, a young 19 year old man by the name of Johnny Fry came riding out these doors and headed west. Well, Linda's already inside and I've got permission to video in there. So let's go take a look. In 1959, they turned this into a museum and they restored the building. This is a gift shop up front and admission is uh, $8, I believe. And this shows Johnny Fry taking off on his first ride there. And there's the doors from the inside. They said this stable was in use as a stable for 43 years, even though the Pony Express only lasted about two years. They came up with this special mailbag that was slung over the saddles, easy, easy on and easy off. It's called a machila. Back in the day, a letter cost, a one ounce letter, they were all packaged up to fit inside these pockets here. A one ounce letter cost five dollars to mail. Later on they invented a special lightweight paper, especially for the Pony Express, uh, where they could pack more letters and then the price went down to one dollar per letter. One dollar back then was still a lot of money. Stretched out across the country they had to come up with about 500 horses and 190 riders. That was a big undertaking. They had to build uh, stations across the US every 10 miles. That, that was a big deal. That took them quite a bit of effort for an enterprise that only lasted two years. All the way from St. Joseph, Missouri, through the Rocky Mountains to Sacramento, California. Riders would leave heading east from Sacramento and riders would leave heading west from St. Joseph, Missouri. Through all kinds of weather, they rode year round. Snowstorms, rainstorms, tornadoes, they experienced it all. Those young riders had to sign a contract. They had to promise not to drink, not to swear, and always to be a good steward of the company, representing the company properly. Orphans preferred. I gotta tell you, the museum is very nice. Um, with the dioramas and everything, it makes it easy 
to imagine what it was like for these writers. They were all by themselves. The only protection they had was the speeder of their horse and the six gun on their hip. That was it, they didn't carry a rifle. Every ounce counted. <laughs> now you can see the mochila here swung across the saddle. It says here that the rider and the male could only total 165 pounds. You had to be pretty small to be a Pony Express rider. In my last video, I showed a covered wagon without the cover on top. Well, here's one that's got the cover. <laughs> And uh, it's the same width, it's about 40 inches wide. This wagon looks to be about 10 feet long. It's a little hard to get a look at it here. So it's a little longer, this one. Contrary to popular belief, you walked, you didn't ride the wagon. That wagon was full of goods. You'll notice that in this wagon, there's no seat up front. They preferred oxen. They could, oxen are just cattle, but they kind of change when you start working them like this, from what I understand. And uh, the oxen could pull hard, they weren't fast, but when you got to where you were going, you could also use them for plowing your fields and getting your farm started. And in an emergency, uh, you know, in a survival situation, you could eat them too. I think you'd really enjoy the museum if you have any interest, interest in history at all. Um, Here's, um, these, these explain different kinds of horses and whether or not they'd be good for the Pony Express and why. And this says thoroughbred breed, and you can read about it, and on the bottom it says a good buy for the Pony Express. The Morgan could haul more weight, it was muscular. They says this, this was a good buy for the Pony Express and used on the eastern part of the routes. Others not so much, like the Clydesdale. Not a good buy for the Pony Express. And it, and it uh, addresses other kinds of horses here also. If you travel across the United States between St. Joseph, Missouri and Sacramento, you can find way stations along the way. Um, most of the time it's just some rocks on the ground. A few of them, the building is still standing somewhat, the foundation, but this is what they would have looked like. I'm not gonna be able to show you inside. This is gonna be really dark. Yep, yep. But basically, there's a fireplace on one end, a table, a couple of bunks on the other end, and that's about it. Some places were there just to supply the rider with a new horse, and then some places were there um, further apart where the rider could actually stop and sleep and get a meal and get a rest while somebody else continued the route. So you see here, starting in St. Joseph, you see every one of these red dots? Everyone was a way station along the way, every 10 miles. So you can see what an enterprise this was, getting this all set up to handle the mail from St. Joseph to Sacramento. Can you imagine what kind of money it would take today to do this? I mean, if you just wanted to do the same thing, for example, can you imagine how much that would cost? This is just some artifacts found along the route. Barrel of a rifle, cylinder of an 1860 Colt revolver, some other bits and pieces here. Look at this amazing sculpture by artist Vic Payne. This is about 10 feet long. Look at the detail in this. And this marks the end of the Pony Express. It was the telegraph. On the day that the first telegraph was sent from St. Louis to Sacramento, that was the end of the Pony Express. They continued on for about a month after that, just delivering packages that they still had. But uh, the telegraph took over. And then of course, right after that, the railroad. Well, this is uh, appropriate because, after all, it was the riders that made the Pony Express. There's a picture of Billy Fisher. 
Patrick McEnany. Richard Cleave was a writer. Gigi San Giovanni was a writer. Here's an actual picture of Johnny Fry, the first writer. Well, each one of these booths here is dedicated to a writer. Very cool. You can hear in the background, we've got a school showing up. It's nice that the kids get to see this and get introduced to this. They won't forget it. This is fascinating. Buffalo Bill Cody was a Pony Express writer at the age of 15 years old. Well, it got a little noisy back there when all the kids showed up, but I'll tell you, what that lady is doing given the tour is way more important than what Linda and I are doing here. I mean, to introduce those kids to this bit of history, that's fantastic. I don't think I have a copper penny. What did you get there? We found a copper penny. Now you turn that. Turn it? Mm hmm go ahead. To the right, yep. Does it feel like it's doing anything? Did you get a gumball? <laughs> oh, it came out beautiful. Yeah. Very nice. Pretty cool. Look at that. Yeah. Well, like I mentioned, when the railroad went in, that, that pretty much took care of everything. And there are a couple of locomotives in this town that you've got to see, and we're going to go take a look at those next. Well, this one is the 5614 from the CB&O, or CB&Q line, Burlington Route. This is a big locomotive. It's huge. This thing is gigantic. I just love steam locomotives because to me, they're as technically advanced for their time as spaceships are today for our time. Whereas the 5614 is a huge locomotive, it's not the biggest. The biggest is called the 4884, and it describes how many wheels it has. Four wheels up front, and then there's four, four, and four. So imagine four, eight, eight, four. But what an amazing piece of machinery. I'm sorry about the fence in the way here, but you can get the idea. This stuff is all gigantic. And everything is perfectly timed to work together. Guess you'd have an engineer and a brakeman and a stoker, one very busy stoker, a man with a shovel, maybe two men with shovels, I don't know. Feeding a fire that takes the water and turns it in and heats it up and turns it into steam and supplies it to the wheels. Burlington Northern took one of those, one of the biggest ones, the 4884s, and I think there was like 25 of those made, and they restored one and put it back into service. That thing is hauling freight again across the U.S. <laughs> yeah, look, uh, look it up. Look up Burlington Northern's biggest locomotive. Wait till you see the next one. Well, this is the original Petit House Hotel here in St. Joseph, and it has a fantastic museum inside. I can't even begin to tell you. Look at this beautiful little wagon. Probably the sports car of its day. <laughs> well, look at this beautiful stagecoach. Looks mighty pretty, but I happen to know it was a very dusty ride. Mm -hmm. A dusty ride and a bouncy ride. 
What a beautiful coach, though. Now, the Pony Express also had their headquarters in the hotel here back in the day. The museum is actually too big for us to show you everything. We're not even going to try, but there's everything represented here from the drugstore of the day, barbershop. The cool thing is, Everything is here, all the accessories in these places. This be the post office. Where you could probably mail your Pony Express letter. Yeah. It's right next to the bank. <laughs> This particular area is really interesting. Hey, Linda, come show them why. <laughs> well, look at these spoon jail keys. They're made from spoons. Looks like a regular spoon, but if you look at the end, they've been turned into keys. These ones down here made out of, looks like they're made out of butter knives. They're pretty uh, creative when they get in prison, I guess, yeah. Yeah. What's on the left side over here? Oh, this is, this is Jesse was just the beginning. These are actual murder weapons that was confiscated by the police. Yeah, and you say something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 19 year old Madeline Robotham was killed at the entrance to Krug Park on January or on July 13, 1913 when her ex-boyfriend slit her throat with this razor. Her mama said she didn't like him. <laughs> I'm just, uh, oh boy. Look at the hammers, the ax, even the drill. It says here that the drill was used to torture the victim. Oh my goodness. And the victim was killed with the hammer that was hit, hit him so hard it broke the handle. Yeah, the murderer was a 16 year old kid. They had bad eggs back then too. These guns were all confiscated from criminals. Actual guns that were confiscated. This is pretty cool. Well, there's all kinds, too. Yeah. Yeah, all kinds. Everything from a broom handle Mauser to... Ha, look at that rotary shot pistol, shotgun pistol right there. Just all kinds of stuff. Cap and ball revolver. Yeah. Look at this one. It looks like a measuring tape. But it's so, what is it? It's a palm pistol. Every time you squeeze it, it pops off a shot and they're loaded in a little rotary disc inside. 32 cal. There's a polygraph lie detector. I didn't do it, I tell ya. Guess they'll find out. Hey, in a previous video, I mentioned that uh, in Hawaii, on a volcano tour, I flew the Dalai Lama over a chicken fight and everybody was running for their cars because they thought we were the sheriff or something or the police uh, spying on their chicken fight. Look at these spurs that they put on the chickens to fight with. There's a lot of money that gets gambled on a chicken fight. Well, that was pretty gruesome in there, but look at this old store here. All kinds of things to catch your eye. Linda's shining a flashlight around because it's dark in here. Yeah, I just like looking at all this stuff. I'm sure a lot of you guys are the same way. This is what I brought you guys here to see. This is a Civil War era locomotive. It is beautiful. Can you imagine back in a day of horses and buggies that they had these? They didn't have cars yet, didn't have airplanes, but they had a locomotive that would haul you and all your belongings across the country. 
I'm just amazed by that. Hey, we can step up inside this. Looks like this one worked off of wood and not coal. This is the engineer's cab it's itself. Looks like the engineer would have ridden over here on this seat, on this side. He's got his controls there and he could look forward out through that window down the front. What's this side? This is where they shovel the coal? Yeah, that's the that's the firebox down there where they'd shovel all the coal. Yep. Self. So this part on the back, behind the locomotive, this is a water tank. And you know these these locomotives had to stop every 10 or 12 miles to refill water? That's why there was a whistle stop like every 10 miles along a line. 10 miles, refill water. 10 miles, refill the water. Hard to see the whole locomotive and everything inside here. I mean, for video, you can get right up to them though. On the back is an exact replica of a mail car. Um, this was the, a replica of the first mail car ever built that brought the mail from the east back to uh, St. Joseph here to go the rest of the way on the Pony Express. And uh, they used mail cars like this for a hundred years. And yeah, it's pretty nice. Then the postmaster would ride inside. Well, like I said, this museum has way too much for me to show in a video. Cars, fire trucks, World War II era Jeep. You see what I mean? There is something for everybody in here. Yeah, this museum is just huge. Upstairs, downstairs, covers all the people that lived in the area. This Native American collection here. This is actually one of those places that's absolutely overwhelming with all the things that they have here. This is a must see, St. Joseph, Missouri. Like I said, Linda and I came here on purpose because of the, this museum and the Pony Express stables. And there's still, still something else I gotta show you here that's just right next door. Hey there, Linda, did you enjoy it? Oh yeah. <laughs> can take a couple of days in there. Easily a couple of days. Yeah, I think I, I almost made it to the third floor. There's a third floor? Yes. I, I didn't get to see that. I guess we got to go back in. Well, it says you can see the old original hotel rooms. Oh. I don't know, maybe I wasn't supposed to go through there, but. That sounds interesting. Yeah, yeah I sure enjoyed it. I, I got way too much to put in this video, so. So you have to come and see for yourself. You have to take our word for it because I cannot show you what I just videoed in there. <laughs> <laughs> this is too much. Just in case that's not enough, come see what's around the corner. Yeah. This is the home of Jesse James where he was shot. Now the home wasn't, like it says here, the home wasn't originally in this location. It was moved here in 1977. So this is the original house. I just came in from the back door here. You can see some artifacts over here that belong to James. Jesse, I mean. But there's the front door of the living room. Now Bob and Charles Ford came over to visit Jesse James and they were planning a bank robbery for a couple days later. I don't know if uh, Jesse was included in that bank robbery or if they were trying to enlist his help. But while they were here, Jesse James noticed that that needle point up there on the wall was crooked, just like it is today. 
and he stepped up on a chair to straighten out the needle point and Bob Ford drew a gun and shot him in the back of the head. The bullet went through just behind his right ear and they say it came out over his left eye. That would have been the bullet hole right there. There's some speculation on whether the bullet actually ex exited his head or not, but people say that the bullet went into the wall right here. That hole has been enlarged by people taking souvenirs from it over the years. It's got a cover over it now, though. This be the other room here. And it's got a lot of uh, facts in here that you can read and you can research this. What you got there, Linda? Oh, this talks about when they exhumed um, Jesse James and got some my mitochondrial DNA to trace, to see if it really was Jesse James buried there because some people say he faked his death. But it proved 99.7% sure that it was Jesse James. Oh, this is the remains of his casket, huh? Yeah. These are artifacts from the original casket. This right here, it's hard to tell, but this is actually a sheet of glass laying on top of here because the casket had a glass front on it. So that's a piece of metal with glass, broken glass on top right there. These are handles from the casket. Yeah. Hmm. Well, he was no Robin Hood. Nope. He was a robber and a murderer. And these are all, these are castings of Jesse James teeth. This was all done during the 1995 exhumation of the of the grave. That orange uh, peg there is where the bullet went in. That's Jesse's wife, Z. James, who just happened to be his first cousin. She was named after his mother. Well, that was something actually getting to go into Jesse James' house, the original house, and seeing all that. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys, this has been a really nice time here in uh, St. Joseph, Missouri. And uh, we're not done yet. There is one other place we're headed right now, though. What was the name of it? We met a lady named Michelle and she Ooh. told us that there is homemade pie at the Frederick Inn and she gave us the address. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going there for lunch and pie right now. Well, I have high hopes because this place came highly recommended for both food and pie. We'll go check it out. Hello, Linda. So I'm going to have the beer battered cod fillets, but check this corner down here. There's a whole list of pies there, and I hear that they're all homemade, and that's why we're here. Well, we changed our mind. I ordered their deluxe hamburger, and Linda ordered a hot roast beef sandwich. Well, it's like they said, the food is all homemade. Um, the meat is very good. Uh, the burger and the hamburger is cooked to order. Just get it exactly the way you want it. And it's good hamburger and a variety of fries. Hey, Linda, what is that? <laughs> it's coconut meringue. Well, that's different. Usually it's a coconut cream. That looks good. And I got a, I got a slice of uh, butterscotch cream. It's a lot bigger than it looks on the camera here. I'm enjoying this one, this butterscotch cream. Okay, this place is highly recommended. The food was fantastic, done right, all American food. The pie was truly homemade pie. It was way, really good. It rates way up there on our list. It's uh, some of the best pie we've ever had. 1627 Frederick Avenue, St. Joseph, Missouri. <laughs> what a busy but pleasant day. What, three, three museums, three Linda? Museums, yeah. And then a, a really fine lunch with really great homemade pie. Yeah. Um, one thing is, uh, we read that Jesse James' wife, Z, saw the bullet hole in the back of his head, but she said that when she, the next day, she saw the hole in the wall where there wasn't one before. So perhaps that bullet went through an eye socket or something like that. But she says that bullet hole was not in the wall before that. So there's that. Now coming up on the next video, you've got to see it because it is just plain crazy.
Yeah, you, stay tuned for that one. It's insane. All right, <laughs> you guys, see you around. Bye.